Well, I hope everyone had a happy Mardi Gras. And uh, now we got to get back to courses. And the first system that we're doing in the histology course is the urinary system. Now here are your learning objections, objectives for this module. And just as a reminder, the, the gross parts of the uh, urinary system, we have uh, bilateral kidneys um, that uh, can see be found in the posterior abdominal area, um, retroperitoneal. And then each kidney has a ureter that is going to bring the urine that is produced by the kidney inferiorly to the urinary bladder. And so the urinary bladder is going to empty to the outside of the body through the urethra. And so we saw all those structures in gross, but I just wanted to give you a little reminder. So <clears throat> the big picture here is that uh, the kidney has a lot of different uh, functions, but number one and the one that's most talked about is that the uh, actual blood components or really the plasma needs to be filtered so uh, waste products need to be removed and the kid that's one of the kidneys function is to um, allow the plasma to filter into a specialized uh, structure and then through tubules that will um, modify the filtrate and um, bring items that need to be reclaimed back into the vascular system back into the bloodstream and then allow the uh, waste products that need to be excreted to leave. And that whole um, main, main part of the filtration aspect happens in a structure called the glomerulus. And we'll, we'll go through the different parts of the, of the glomerulus, but that is the specialized structure. That's kind of the hallmark of the, of the kidney. Uh, and so some, as, as I just mentioned, some of the uh, products that get filtered out need to actually then be uh, reabsorbed because we don't want to excrete everything that we filter through uh, the glomerulus. We don't want to let all of that leave the body. So a lot of the water that, that comes out of the plasma and some other uh, molecules that you're going to learn about um, the exact balance that occurs in the physiology class, but that's going to be reabsorbed and then everything else will be excreted. And so most all of that function is going to happen in specialized tubules that are part of, of the nephron. And so that's kind of just highlighted that um, you'll be talking about every part of it and what is selectively done in that different portion in physiology. So the one of the main functions of the kidney is to actually balance a lot of, of uh, products that you have in your plasma but it also functions as the gland, or the tubules itself uh, fun will function as a gland because uh, some, of the, um, some of the items that will be filtered from the vascular system into the interstitium um, will be taken up by parts of the tubules and, and there's some, um, some examples here like creatinine and some drugs and like antibiotics, um, uric acid and diuretics will, been, will be taken up by the epithelial cells of the tubule and then secreted into the tubule so that they can uh, go along the tubule and be uh, excreted with the body. And then you can see here the another part of the tubule where you would have potassium hydrogen ions and urea. And you'll, again, you'll learn about it, all the specific numbers and how that happens in phys, but I'm trying to give you the big picture. So acid-base balance is another function of the kidney uh, because of how the tubules help um, secrete hydrogen ions into the urine. All right, but then the, there are also some hormo hormonal and metabolic functions that occur in the kidney. They don't um, necessarily uh, occur always in all the tubules, but um, renin is secreted. It's synthesized by the kidney and it's secreted. We'll talk about the uh, specific cells that do that. And it is a very important component of the renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, mechanism that controls blood pressure. And you've already been um, introduced to this by the physiology class, and it's just going to be reinforced in this block in the physiology class also. And uh, actually, Dr. Glover talked to you about erythropoietin and how that um, simulates the production of erythrocytes. Well, that is actually uh, produced by uh, the kidney. And uh, vitamin D is going to um, be converted uh, from an inactive form to an active form by cells in the kidney. And so uh, that is important for blood calcium balance. So all of those things are also important functions of the organ. 
All right. Um, I know we didn't really have like a whole specific lecture on the kidney. So just as a reminder, uh, the kidney has two main parts, um, two main anatomic uh, differences to the cortex, which is the outer part. Um, here you can see it on this gross picture. The cortex is the outer part. And then the inner part, uh, which is called the medulla. Now the cortex has different tissue. We'll talk about the, the what exists there. And that tissue extends and like finger-like projections down into the medulla as uh, cortical columns. And so you can see those extending here. And so um, the uh, medulla is going to be the part with the ducts that are going to drain um, the what is going to be excreted into the collecting system. And so each papillary um, or papilla of, the, of a um, pyramid here, medullary pyramid, is going to drain into a minor calyx. So that's the first part here, this collecting system, which is going to join with other minor, minor calyces to make a major calyx. And all the major calyces come together here at uh, uh, the renal pelvis and then is going to funnel into the ureter. So the renal pelvis is the part that where the ureter dilates and gets and gets large and the uh, uh, renal sinus is sort of this whole area here that can even have um, fats and and there where the blood vessels and everything comes into the hilum of the kidney and so this is just a gross picture of what it looked like um, in gross anatomy last semester and as a development refresher, uh, you remember that we had some different sources and we had some transient kidneys, but for, for the, uh, the kidney that is going to eventually remain to be the adult kidney, we had a couple different sources. One is the ureteric bud, the ureteric bud that you see here sticking out, and that is going to actually develop into all of the collecting system. So starting with those, um, those collecting, uh, basically like the minor calyces and everything that is draining from the medulla of the pier of the pyramid in the medulla of the kidney. And then the metaronephrogenic blastema, which was coming from that mesoderm that was surrounded, that surrounded the ureteric bud, that is going to develop into the medulla and the cortex. And very specifically, um, the renal arteries are going to get smaller and smaller to make the vasculature, which will grow into the glomeruli, which is a, a tuft of capillaries will help you sort of understand that that's where that's coming from. All right, which also is from as a term. <clears throat> and so um, the blood flow through the kidney is a, is a big one that you want to uh, sort of learn because uh, you can, they, these arteries go in different directions and they surface different, different parts of the kidney. So a renal artery, as it comes into the kidney, it's going to separate into larger segmental arteries. And so you can see these segmental arteries here. And they, they kind of have different numbers just depending on how many pyramids that each kidney has. And the segmental arteries are going to then further branch into interlobar arteries. And the interlobar arteries are going to run in the uh, columns, in the renal columns, which is that cortical tissue that's sticking down between the pyramids and the medulla. So here you have interlobar arteries. So interlobar arteries are going to make a 90 degree turn and run uh, parallel to the cortex. And those arteries that turn like that are called arcuate arteries. And then off the arcuate arteries, there are smaller arteries that come off and extend into the cortex. And much, all of these are getting smaller and smaller. And those are called interlobular arteries. And so they are coming off of that. They're also called cortical radial arteries. And so here you can see the microvasculature um, is because those uh, interlobular arteries are going to uh, then give rise to the afferent arterioles that are going to make up the glomerular capillaries. Eventually it's going to be, become a tuft of capillaries um, called the glomerular capillaries or the glomerulus. And then as it is going to be continuous with the uh, arterial leaving the glomerular capillary, so it goes to the capillary and then it gets larger, and that's called the efferent arterial. And then the efferent arterial um, is going to actually uh, make paratubular capillaries, a whole other capillary system that is going to run adjacent to the tubules of the kidneys. And so these paratubule capillaries are going to be places where you're going to have reabsorption 
of the fluid and other substrates such as glucose, etc., that has come has been actively pulled from the filtrate and taken by those epithelial cells into the interstitium, and then it's going to go into these capillaries so that it can go back into the vascular system. And then you have other um, capillaries, very small capillaries that extend into this uh, long part of the nephron called the loop of Henle, and they've run uh, more sort of up and down um, to also absorb and um, help concentrate urine and, and play a big role here. And, and those are called the vasa recta, and you're going to find main, mainly that going to uh, be positioned in the medulla of the kidney. Okay. So the vasculature is actually really, really important. And then on the on the other side of the on the venous side, um, they go they actually follow with the same names essentially as the arteries that came from the renal artery to the cortex, and then you have the similarly named veins that go back out to the renal vein. All right, so what is a nephron? You might have heard the term. Um, the nephron is just the functional unit of the kidney, so it has a few different parts. It's, it has that glomerulus, and um, which is a tuft of capillaries, but then it has a bunch of tubules that are associated with it, and um, and it actually is encapsulated with a capsule called Bowman's capsule, and that is also part of the nephron. So it's a functional unit of the kidney. Uh, and so the renal corpuscle, as you can see here, is going to be made up of the glomerulus. If you hear someone ask you just specifically about a renal corpuscle, what they're referring to is just the glomerulus or the tuft of capillaries plus the capsule, Bowman's capsule that is surrounding it. If someone asks you about a nephron, they're also talking about the tubules. But if they ask you about a renal, a renal corpuscle, they mean just the glomerulus or the um, tuft of capillaries here plus this capsule that is uh, made up of specialized cells that we'll talk about. Now um, just to give you a little refresher of uh, Bowman's capsule, so as the developing glomerulus is, is uh, being uh, developed from the you know the arteries which eventually have stemmed out all the way out from the afferent arterial, it is going to sort of stick down into um, into this uh, metanephrogenic blastema that was developing. And that is going to be like a hand pushing into a balloon. And so as the glomerulus extends and expands, it sticks down into that metanephrogenic blastema and then it makes this two layered uh, capsule. So we have a, a visceral layer, which is the layer that's very adjacent to the glomerular capillaries. And then there ends up being a parietal layer that is on the, on the outside or the most outer portion of the renal corpuscle. And between those two layers, you end up having a urinary space, okay? So that's where the actual filtrate is going to come out of the vascular system, and it's going to come across the visceral layer, and it, all of that filtrate, which some of which is going to become urine, will fill that space, and then it's going to flow down to the first part of the tubule, which is co continuous with the outer layer Bowman's capsule. All right, and the visceral layer of Bowman's capsule is made up of specialized cells that aren't found anywhere else, and they're called uh, podocytes. Okay, and podocytes—they uh, look uh, really cool. Uh, the next slide, I'll show you an EM, but uh, they have really cool foot processes that stick out from them, and um, they have larger ones uh, that come out. If you see this cartoon pro cartoon drawing here, they're called primary foot processes, and then they have smaller processes that stick out from the primary that are called secondary foot processes. And um, they actually envelop the glomerular capillaries, and they make a basement membrane that fuses with the basement membrane of the endothelial cell of the capillary. Um, and, but the cell body usually sort of sticks up uh, out in the middle here, and so most of the capillary is hugged by these podocytes that are um, interdigitating with each other to make a barrier that only elect, uh, allows certain substrates to come across the barrier and into the urinary space. And this is what it looks like in an EM, really cool. So here you can see the cell body and you can see primary foot processes that are sticking off and then secondary foot processes that look like the little fingers um, 
that are, are interdigitating with each other. So all of these, uh, all of this area that you're looking at here are foot processes coming off of podocytes. So they're completely enveloping and wrapping around the glomerular capillaries. And, uh, and so the, these cells are important or, or um, are important as well as the endothelial cell of the glomerular capillary at making a filtration barrier. So it, let's pretend like this is a cross section and I've drawn a capillary here. Here's a red blood cell in the capillary and then there's plasma all around. These capillaries are fenestrated and so there are fenestrations that are going to allow um, substrates to cross. Um, or at least some of them, not, not big cells like red blood cells, but um, smaller components of plasma. And then you have a basement membrane um, that is the, uh, part of it is made by the endothelial cell, part of it is made by the podocyte, let's put it like this, is the podocyte on this side here. Here you can see podocyte, the foot processes. And the foot processes have uh, slit diaphragms that go from one side to another that we'll talk about. And here's, um, let's pretend like this is Bowman space here. Okay, and so the endothelium of the capillary is one of the components, anatomic components of the filtration barrier. Uh, then the glomerular basement membrane is actually the most important uh, component of this barrier. And then you have the podocyte foot processes. And then there is a very small sub-podocyte space that is, is important or supposed to be important um, for, for the barrier as well. Your book doesn't talk about, this version of the book didn't talk about it too much, but um, the last version had more of it in there. All right, so the basement membrane itself, which is sort of this grayish homogenous area here in this EM, is supposed to be the most substantial part. And as you probably would have guessed, the basement membrane, like other basement membranes, is going to have laminin and fibronectin in there, and that which are going to bind to integrins that are on the cell membranes of both the endothelial cell and the podocytes. So you have a lot of uh, type 4 collagen that's cross-linked into this matrix, and it's important to note that um, these there are negatively charged proteoglycans, and so charge can be one of the ways that certain substances get repelled from being able to cross uh, the, the barrier. So not only is it a physical barrier, but it's also a charged bar um, barrier that will repel certain mo molecules because of their charges. And then... I sort of drew in lines here to pretend like you could see these filtration slits that are on the secondary foot processes of the podocytes. So these are really specialized intercellular junctions that involve a large transmembrane pro protein that's called nephrin. And so it's sort of making this, this link and this certain size um, barrier, like a filter, that uh, will only let um, certain size molecules to cross the um, cross the filtration barrier. Okay, and so I kind of tried to show you where they would be located on these other diagrams and other p uh, pictures that I showed you. All right, now those podocytes are not the only cells that are in the in the corpuscle. You also have mesangial cells. Now mesangial cells are not wrapping around their capillaries are actually kind of like extra cells that are in between the podocytes and the glomerular capillaries. Um, and they're important for giving just this corpuscle some structural support um, because otherwise it would be, it's a pretty um, fragile structure, but they are um, important for the phagocytosis of protein aggregates. So if you can imagine that like, there are different types of antibody antigen complexes and other, other um, antigens that can get um, stuck almost in this filtration barrier or it will attach itself to it. And so mesangial cells will help un undergo phagocytosis and remove some of these as, as it can. I mean, it can't, it can't um, always keep up if you have a pathological condition, but it can remove these complexes to help keep that barrier um, healthy. And they, these cells also secrete several um, cytokines and prostaglandins that are going to be important for um, immune defense repair and contraction. So these are good supporting cells. And then um, the endothelial cells are actual, actually the cells of the capillary themselves. So don't forget that they are, are cells that are part of the glomerulus. And a lot of the nuclei that you see will be endothelial cells. It's really kind of hard to, um, when you see a glomerulus, really separate them out and, and identify one cell as another. So don't get too stuck down trying to do that. 
All right. So this is just a sort of an anatomic direction thing. Um, a lot of people refer to uh, the corpuscle, well, it's, it's correct to refer it to having a tubular pole versus a vascular pole. So if the, here is a renal corpuscle, there's the tuft of glomeruli here in the center. And you can see Bowman's capsule, um, the visceral layer is going to be the part that's directly adherent to the glomerular capillaries, but the parietal layer is the part out here. So this is a urinary space in between. And uh, the tubule pole is going to be the part that is going to be continuous. The urinary space becomes continuous with the first part of the tubule of the rest of the nephron, which is called the proximal convoluted tubule. So this is it in a cartoon drawing. See, it's the urinary space is just continuous here, coming from the metanephrogenic blastema. And so this is a, another picture here. Here you have the tubular pole. The urinary space is continuous with the first part here, this uh, proximal convoluted tubule and this is the vascular pole you can see a small arterial here with a little red blood cell inside and here is the uh, glomerular tuft of, glomer of glomerulus there all right so the first tubule um, you have here part of the tubule here highlighted in blue is called the proximal convoluted tubule and it's kind of the, the main player. It, it is going to be the biggest, uh, the most important part of the, tube, of the tubular system that is going to uh, reabsorb substrates, so water and also lots of other substrates. So a, a lot of things happen in the proximal convoluted tubule. And uh, because of this, it has an extensive uh, brush border, lots and lots of microvilli that are going to extend off the apical part of these cells. But it also has numerous um, intracellular junctions. So uh, the uh, lateral aspects of these cells are also really folded and, um, and joined together with neighboring cells. And also the basal aspect, or more specifically the basal lateral aspect of the cells are, have a lot of enfoldings as well. And so it's kind of hard to tell where one of these cells ends and one of them begins. They're also really big cells. And so when you're looking at uh, the proximal convoluted tubule, you might, you're not always going to see each cell cut in the nucleus. And so um, you're going to see that it has a simple cuboidal epithelium, but you're not going to see a nuclei, nucleus all the way around. Okay, and you see these uh, proximal convoluted tubule in the cortex and also in medullary rays. So this is what it looks like. All of these here are all proximal convoluted tubules. The inside tends to look fuzzy, but that's because of the numerous microvilli on the inside and also, you know, just has some aggregated proteins that get stuck in there. But when you're looking at the cells, you might see nucleus, 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 skip one, there's one, skip, 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 there's another one. So you don't see a continuous ring of nuclei like you might see in other um, tubules and you also don't see very very clear lines of where one cell stops and the other ones begin and that's these are those are characteristic um, marks for a proximal convoluted tubule okay so the next tubule is called the loop if you're just following along the drainage pattern of filtrate is going to be the nephron loop of Henle and so um, although the proximal convoluted tubule will have uh, will go into a thick uh, descending limb you don't really have to identify uh, where that happens necessarily for us but you will talk about the difference in physiology and, and how all of that stuff differs so we're just going to move on to the uh, the nephron loop of Henley which uh, mainly for us that you're going to be able to see histologic differences are going to be in the between the uh, the thin limbs but um, so, you know, though, physiologically, when you talk about it, you're going to have the filtrate is going to descend downwards from where the proximal convoluted tubule is, and then it's going to recur or loop back upwards through a thin part and then a thick segment before it starts uh, the next convoluted part, which is called the distal convoluted tubule. And so um, here it's also going to be a simple cuboidal um, epithelium in the thick parts of the loop but in where it gets to the thin part of the loop both the descending and ascending the epithelium looks simple squamous and so um, it does it does look different now you're not necessarily going to have to 
um, identify all of these parts because especially the thin the thin uh, parts of the loop of Henley look just like the vasa recta or the um, the capillaries around them but you're not going to see any red blood cells in it but I'm not going to make you say is this a vasa recta or is this a thin part of a loop of Henry you're not going to have to Henley you're not going to have to do that but you should be able to identify the difference between a proximal convoluted uh, from a thick segment than you would from a thin segment that but you wouldn't have to necessarily distinguish the thin from each other or the thick from each other unless it's uh, convoluted ones all right and so um the overall purpose of the loop of henley is to uh, concentrate the urine and uptake a lot more uh, of the water that came out of the blood plasma. You can't, you can't, you don't want to excrete everything that you filter out of the plasma or you would be constantly losing so much water. And so what you learn about is how the permeability changes a lot from, from the descending limb to the ascending limb of the loop of Henley. And this is going to actually make uh, the the urine very very concentrated and you have a lot of movement of water and um, ions in and out of the loop of Henley they can't like for example water is very very permeable maybe in the descending limb but in the ascending is impermeable so the water can't doesn't get back in and and so the con the urine becomes more concentrated and then everything that has been taken out here can be reabsorbed into the vascular system because of the um, web of vasa recta that is right on the outside of the loop of Henley. So, that, so that's kind of a neat uh, purpose in the way that this works. Um, you'll learn about very specific, the specifics about it in physiology, but your histology textbook sort of gives you the overview. All right, and then after um, it, after the filtrate has come through the loop of Henley, it goes through a small portion that's called the straight tubule, um, and and that is almost considered um, that would be like right in this area. That is almost considered a special separate part from the distal convoluted tubule in physiology, and that is because of the fact um, that the macula densa occurs there, and Doctor. Um, Harrison Bernard will tell you exactly what she needs to know about that. So I don't want to confuse you. Um, your textbook for histology, for histologic purposes, you know, moves you right into mainly the distal convoluted tubule. But there is a short straight segment that is important physiologically. And so I, d I don't want to uh, make that not apparent. I want to I want to point that out to you. So in the d distal convoluted tubule, you do have some uh, reabsorption that does occur, but it's not as much as in the proximal um, convoluted tubule and so you don't have a big brush border that you did like you did in the proximal convoluted tubule but if you look at where it's located at all up here distal and proximal so if you were looking at a section of the kidney you're going to see these both in the same section but you're not necessarily going to you're not going to see a brush border though in the distal convoluted tubule and it does have a simple cuboidal epithelium but the cells are not as big as the the cells in the proximal convoluted tubule so you do see more nuclei that are continuous in the section and they're a little bit um well i guess they don't have to necessarily be as acidophilic but you're definitely just not going to see not going to see the blood the brush border and you see more clear uh lines in between in between the cells and so here is a um, but, uh, picture of the distal convoluted tube. And actually, this is cut in, in a longitudinal section, these two are. And these are all proximal convoluted tubules that are cut. See how many more? You don't have any gaps of nuclei. You have a lot more nuclei that are all lined up with each other in these distal convoluted tubules here. Uh, and so that is very, that's kind of, to me, I mean, they're not as acidophilic they don't have as many mitochondria. But um, over here with this proximal convoluted tube, you have large gaps where you don't see any nuclei, and that's just a little bit easier for me. Um, and then also the, the sort of so-called fuzziness of the inside of the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule is a, more apparent. And so that's how you can tell these apart. And you do have to tell these two apart. All right. So in the uh, straight portion of the distal tubule, um, you have a specialized structure that's uh, called, well, it plays a role in the juxtaglomerular juxta, juxta apparatus. And so it doesn't only 
involve the straight portion of the distal tubule, but that is one of the players. It also is going to involve the afferent arterial, and it's also going to involve some extra glomerular mesangial cells. And the overall purpose is to auto-regulate uh, renal blood flow. So the blood flow that's going to um, flow through the glomerulus, but also plays uh, a role in also reg regulating um, blood pressure as a whole as, as well. All right, and so um, the the wall of that uh, straight portion of the distal tubule has some thick, <clears throat> thickened, taller cell columnar cells that are is co collectively called the macula densa, and um, and these cells they're kind of they're kind of easy to spot. It's it's interesting because the nuclei are all sort of packed in at the apical part of the cells. They have uh, a lot of Golgi complexes that you may or may not see. I normally just see that they are they're taller, but. Um, and they do have a lot of other um, changes, like a lot more channels um, and transporters because of their because of their role. And so they are going to release prostaglandins, um, and they also to stimulate the juxtaglomerular uh, cells, the granular juxtaglomerular cells that are in the afferent arterial, stimulates them to release renin. Um, and then they also have a primary cilium on them. They have microvilli, but they have a primary cilium that is going to sense sodium and chloride levels in the distal convoluted tubule so that they can trigger responses when necessary. So this, this macula densa does more than one job. Okay, and so the granular juxtaglomerular cells um, are the ones now that I'm pointing to. They are in the their modified smooth muscle cells in the wall of the afferent arterial, and they are going to um, secrete renin. Okay, and then uh, let me see if I can aquaporin. Okay, I think I stopped on this slide and I like kept talking. Um, so if I'm repeating myself, I apologize, but I, I forgot to hit the record button. Um, and so uh, the collecting duck, uh, I hope I just talked about the <laughs> antidiuretic hormone receptors on, on these cells and the fact that they can change in and out of the number of aquaporin um, channels so that uh, you can have a response to antidiuretic hormone and reabsorb more water in the collecting ducts. And so although there's not a lot of, of other um, absorption that is occurring of other substrates, uh, water can be absorbed in these ducts. And so when you're looking at a histologic slide of the collecting ducts, um, you can see that these cells are, are a lot taller than um, than they uh, are here in these neighboring tubules, which are looks like thick segments here of the loop of Henry Henley. But um, I know they don't necessarily look that much taller upon initial inspection. But check out this cell. This cell's nucleus is taking up the entire cell. But this this nu this cell is taller because the nucleus, which is about the same size, is only taking up half of the cell. So collecting ducts are way taller. They're not as acidophilic because they don't have as many mitochondria and they're not of trying to actively going through active transport to absorb a whole bunch of substrates. Um, and so that's why they have the characteristic look that they do. Okay, And they do have... Um, two different cell types. They have principal cells and intercalated cells, but you don't have to tell um, them apart in the histologic sections. But one of the things that will also help you is you see these lines? These lines in the cells are separating where one cell ends and the other begins. And when you look at these other tubules, it's very fuzzy. They just sort of all run into each other. And that's also another characteristic of these ducts. So I gave you this little game that you can play. So what can you find in the cortex? And I made a list and then I gave you a slide set so you can look for some of these structures in the cortex, at the corticomedullary junction, uh, and in the medulla. And some of these uh, structures are only in one place or another, like they're not, they're all the glomeruli are going to be in the cortex. Um, or to corticomedullary junction, but mainly the cortex. Although the loops of Henle can come all the way down into the medulla, about six seventh of the uh, nephrons are in the cortex, but you have one seventh of them that um, do extend, uh, the loops do extend down into the medulla. And so uh, you can check that out as well. 
And then this is for the pelvis of the kidney, which where you're going to see minor calyxes and you're going to see a papilla of a medullary pyramid um, that is uh, projecting into the minor calyx. And that brings us to the collecting system. So the collecting system itself has several um, characteristics that are um, in um, the kind of unique to the collecting system. So the first thing would be the fact that it has transitional epithelium, which is also called urothelium. Um, and uh, hopefully you remember that as, as from the first time that we learned epithelium, it was one special type, but it was a special type because of the most luminal cells being dome shaped. Um, underneath the epithelium, there's a uh, lamina propria that usually kind of is folded because the fact that the organs, uh, no matter what organ it is, they can extend at least a little bit due to the amount of urine that it is holding at the time. And then there is going to be um, some smooth muscle layers that have um, relative good a level of arrangement. And then there's going to be an adventitia or serosa on the outside. Um, so the transitional epithelium is unique. Uh, it has um, basal cells, cells that are located at the basal aspect of epithelium. Then it has some stratified columnar sh shaped cells uh, that, that take up the middle portion of the epithelial sheets. And then it has some bulging dome shaped cells at the most apical part of the epithelium. These cells are called umbrella cells or dome, dome cells. Your book calls them umbrella, but I've seen them called dome cells in lots of books. And those cells are unique. They have a lot of extracellular, I mean, intercellular junctions, that's true with each other. So a lot of occluding junctions to hold them tight together or tight junctions to stop the um, urine from being able to uh, work its way through the cellular um, sheet. But they also have unique lipid rafts at the apical portion of the cells that have specialized protein, membrane proteins that are called uroplaquins. And they're essentially like shields, they're impermeable. And these plaques um, are really protecting the cells that are the parts of the cells that are directly in contact with the urine. And the other cool thing about these plaques is that they're linked together um, with the, to each other. These rafts are linked together by normal parts of membrane that allow them to fold, um, fold down when the bladder becomes um, uh, empty to allow uh, the bladder to sort of reduce its size. So it, it's kind of a neat mechanism, like if you took one of those balls that you, you know, you pulled it out and then it, it got all big and then you can kind of squeeze it back down. And that's what I think about when I think of these um, lipid rafts and these uroplicans. All right, and here's a link for the ureter uh, if you want to look at the microanatomy of the ureter. And I hope that you remember that the ureter has a very delicate, not only nervous supply, but also blood supply that can be disrupted in surgeries or when you um, just just holding over the ureter, or people can accidentally snip the ureter. Uh, and so it's one of those fragile structures. And it transports the urine from the kidney to the bladder by these um, peristalsic movements that occur due to the smooth muscle in the wall. And it has a folded lamina propria, so the epithelium looks folded too. And so this is what the ureter looks like. Um, the up close view, you can see the transitional epithelium. Uh, you can see that here's the lamina propria, and then it has smooth muscle, smooth muscle in the wall, and then you can see the um, adventitia loose connective tissue and um, some other collagen and areas around here. And so this is a link in the general characteristics of the bladder. Uh, the bladder has uh, also urethelium or transitional epithelium, similar um, uh, folded lamina propria, but it has three layers that are kind of roughly organized of smooth muscle that we collectively call the dratuser detrusor muscle, okay? And then um, it has an adventitia, but at the superior portion where the peritoneum, where the uh, parietal peritoneum contacts the bladder, there isn't gonna be an adventitia at that part of the bladder. So this is what the bladder looks like uh, when you're looking at a section. Now it's gonna be a lot thicker than like what that ureter would look like, like a complete tube. And here you can see the bundles of smooth muscle in the wall. Uh, here is the lamina propria, and here is the um, epithelium that I have close closer up view so you can see where those dome cells reside and those columnar shaped cells and the basal cells um, and that's what you're looking at here 
All right, now the urethra, I have a, a picture here of the urethra in the female and then also the urethra in the male. Similar characteristics, uh, the most proximal aspects of the female and male urethra are going to have that transitional or urethelium, and that's going to transition um, in the male. Uh, we've we've uh, been through how that transitions, but in the female, it's going to um, eventually come out and transition to a non-keratinized uh, stratified squamous epithelium, just like the labia minora have. Um, and then it, it has also a folded lamina propria underneath the epithelium, and then it has some uh, smooth muscle layers around the outside that do not look necessarily as uh, organized as something like the vas deferens, but it definitely has relative organization. And then you can also find some glands, depending on where you are in the urethra, and the slide, slide box have, have different um, locations. So you can find periurethral glands that will secrete uh, mucus into the lumen. For the male, one, one for example is the bulbourethral gland. The, the, both male and females have multiple periurethral glands, smaller glands, that do secrete into the lumen to help protect and lubricate the lumen. And here you can see the penile urethra that is actually embedded here in the corpus spongiosum. Okay, and that's all I have for you. That's just sort of a, if you wanted to watch it and you didn't want to read the text and you didn't want to just flip through the guide, just give you a little overview of the um, histology of the urinary system, and I will see you in class.